This is Professor Bittinger. In this short video lecture, we're going to focus on environmentally sustainable economies and how we measure economic success for a country as well as environmental performance for a country. Your first slide is titled Shifting to More Environmental Sustainable Economies. Your textbook proposes that migrating away from a high throughput economy and towards a low throughput economy will help us move towards sustainability. The benefits of this would be the use of less raw materials, the generation of less waste. Now we are taking some steps in this direction. For example, using recycled materials as raw materials helps us decrease the amount of extracting raw materials from the environment. In addition, finding secondary uses for waste material as a raw material for another company or manufacturing process can decrease the need to extract raw materials for that secondary use. This is called beneficial use. So reducing, reusing, and recycling is definitely a component of shifting from a high throughput economy to a low throughput economy. Another factor of shifting to a more environmental sustainable economy is that it can foster new growth in industry, as well as create new jobs, known as green jobs. A more sustainable economy will likely only come when industry and government both understand the need, especially in the area of energy efficiency and renewable energy. One item that we use to measure how well a country is performing from an economic standpoint is the gross domestic product. The gross domestic product was designed prior to the awareness of beneficial or harmful environmental impacts and therefore does not take them into account. So it doesn't include any aspect of the environment. The definition of gross domestic product is on your slide. It is the annual value of all goods and services produced or operating within a country. We use the gross domestic product as an indicator of economic growth. A country's economic growth per person can be used as well to determine how well that economic growth is distributed throughout the country. These indicators are used for measuring and comparing national economic outputs between various countries. The slide in front of you depicts two things countries by gross domestic product or product purchasing power from 2014 data and the lower half of the figure depicts countries that are in an eco surplus being green or yellow or in an eco deficit being red or orange this figure on the bottom you've seen before the top figure is new to you this figure is depicting gross domestic product on a per capita basis if the GDP is greater than $20,000 per capita, then it's considered to be a high income country. If the GDP is in the range of less than $2,000, it's considered to be a low income country. So looking at this graphic, the low income countries fall in that light pale yellow color and there are a few countries that fit into this category in Africa including the De Democratic Republic of Congo as being in the lowest GDP scenario. The next shade in color of yellow is the 2000 to 5000 range of GDP and this qualifies as lower middle income category. There are definitely more countries exhibiting a GDP in this category range than in the high income category range. When you look at Africa, about 75% of Africa falls in this category of lower middle income range based on the GDP.
Countries in the high income category of greater than 20,000 GDP are going to be colored in the dark black and the dark green. Notice that Canada, United States are included in this category, as well as Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay in South America. Australia is included, New Zealand, Japan, Russia, much of Europe. And then interestingly enough, Iran, I'm sorry, my mistake, Saudi Arabia is also in this category with Oman directly next to it. Those countries may fall in this category based on oil production. Now in comparing the two figures, it's interesting to look at GDP in relation to whether or not countries are considered to be in a surplus or a deficit. The United States has a high GDP and we are considered to be in an ecological deficit. Again, that's because we're a highly consumptive society. The countries that fall in the GDP category where China falls between the ten to twenty thousand dollar GDP also are in the ecological deficit scenario. Interestingly enough, Australia has a high GDP between thirty five to fifty thousand dollars, yet it is in an ecological surplus. So they have a good economy and they're doing well in terms of protecting the environment. It's a good figure to do some comparisons. Russia also has a high GDP in the range of twenty thousand to thirty five thousand dollars per capita and they too are considered to be in a surplus. Canada is in the same boat. Part of these variations are based on land size, geographic area, and climate and population numbers. This graphic is depicting the differences between developed and developing countries in relation to population numbers, population growth, wealth and income, resource use, pollution and waste, as well as life expectancy. The developed countries are depicted by the red bar. The developing countries are depicted by the yellow bar in the graphic. Countries that fall in the category of developed countries include the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, Germany, and most of Europe. This equals about 1.3 billion people. Countries that fall under the category of developing are most of the countries that are found in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We can actually break this into two categories. Middle income countries, or moderately developed, include China, India, Brazil, Thailand, and Mexico. Low income countries, or the least developed, include Nigeria, Bangladesh, Congo, and Haiti. The number of people living in developing countries, whether they are in the middle income, moderately developed, or the low income, least developed category, is about 5.7 billion people. If you look at the graphic on the right hand side, the first bar chart for population agrees with this. It indicates that about 82% of the world's population are living in developing countries, and 18% of the world's population are living in developed countries. So most of, our, most of the people in the world are living in developing countries. The other interesting aspect to this is population growth. The population growth depicted on the graphic for developing countries is about 1.5% on average. In developed countries it's 0.1%. So currently most of the population growth is occurring in developing countries and these countries are least equipped to handle such large population increases. In terms of life expectancy, people are living longer in developed countries versus developing countries. In terms of wealth and income, 85% of the global wealth is contained within developed countries, whereas 15% is in developing countries. Now if you look at that closely, that means that 85% of the world's wealth is being held by 18% of the world's population. This is a definite indication that we do not have any 
we are just not close to any kind of equality in wealth distribution. In other words, there's a small percentage of people around the world that are living in a high income scenario. As far as resource use is concerned, most of the resources used is being done in developed countries. And that makes sense because those countries are wealthy and have uh, purchasing power. 88% of the resource use occurs in wealthy countries or developed countries, which contains, again, the least amount of population globally. It makes sense that if most of the resource use is occurring in these developed countries, that most of the pollution and waste is also occurring in these developed countries as depicted on the graphic. 75% of the pollution and waste is being contributed to developed countries, whereas 25% falls under the category of developing countries. So this graphic really does depict an unequal distribution of wealth, an unequal distribution of use of resources, and an unequal distribution of the amount of waste and pollution that's being generated. It really does fall in the hands of the developed countries to make a choice to proceed forward with pursuing sustainability. As I mentioned earlier, the GDP does not incorporate impact to the environment. A new indicator that tries to measure environmental impact as well as social impact is the Genuine Progress Indicator, GPI. You will learn more about the GPI during one of your laboratory exercises later on this semester. This figure is titled Monitoring Environmental Progress and it compares the U.S. and Brazil in terms of changes in forest cover. This is based on the United Nations Environmental Indicators and it's a way in which we can measure environmental quality including growth or shrinkage of forest cover. So on the y-axis we have forest cover in area of millions of square kilometers and on the x-axis we have the year. And this is indicating that over time, the U.S. has stayed pretty steady in relation to the amount of forest cover that we have present in our geographic region. And the Brazil, the country of Brazil, has actually seen a slight decline in the number of millions of square kilometers of forest cover. So we are trying to track data in terms of how these countries are performing and doing uh, better for the environment. Now I don't have any slides on this, but you will be watching a video called State of the Planet Earth Report that talks about the Environmental Performance Index. This is a topic that you will go into more detail in for one of the labs that you're doing this semester.